Our scripture reading this week, or scripture memorization, was from John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Folks, we are the caretakers, purveyors, and proclaimers of that no condemnation in Christ Jesus message. We are the ones who have been prepared by God to share that. And today as we gather as his children to worship in spirit and in truth, may we do so mindful of this God who sacrificed his son that we could be saved and that others could be saved also. May we do so lovingly and longingly to be with our Heavenly Father for eternity. May God bless us as together we worship today. The scripture reading for today will be Ephesians 4, verse 13. Verse 1 through 3, sorry. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, for all lowliness and gentleness with long suffering, bearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Good morning. What a blessing it is to be here today. Our God has blessed us richly, and we return our thanks to him and our worship to him for those blessings. And one of the blessings is that I'm glad that uh, Mark didn't sing it won't be very long before my lesson. I'm reminded of uh, a, a dear brother and mentor of mine who was... Um, preaching uh, a meeting, and uh, the song leader, before he got up to preach, led Ready to Suffer. <laughs> and uh, he, he actually included that in a book that he wrote called Appropriate Songs at Inappropriate Times, uh, which I found that to be quite funny. I'm glad that you're here today. I know that there's a lot of places you could be today, but you, you chose to be here with God's people worshiping and uh, encouraging each other, and, and I'm so glad that you are. The lesson today is one of extreme importance, and as I think about going to Guyana, I, I always think about what if I don't return. Um, it's just, um, uh, it, it's way past a third world country in the interior where we go. Um, it's not dangerous per se, but there are things that can happen there that could bring an end to your life that if they happened here, they could be very easily taken care of just because we, the, the, the modern essentials that, that we count on here are not available there. And so when I, I preach a lesson before I go, I always try to think, you know, if, if something happens to me, that's the last lesson anybody's ever going to hear from me. What will they remember? And so today's uh, message is with that in mind. Would you please pray with me? Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the love you've given us, and thank you so much for the blessings that we have. We're so grateful, Father, to be here and, and to have your word to, to hear from you. And as we open it, Father, we ask you to speak to our hearts and minds and encourage us in Jesus' name. Amen. It has been said that the history of religion is the history of division, and that is very much the case. Well, if you go back uh, to chapter 4 in Genesis, Cain and Abel, what were they doing? They were sacrificing, they were worshiping, they were engaging in religion before God. And there was division between these brothers. Uh, when you think about Israel and Judah, Israel and Judah after Solomon split and religion was a part of that. It wasn't the entirety of it. And they ended up dividing over religion during that period of time. When you think about the Sadducees and the Pharisees in the New Testament, 
they had very different points of view even though they were coming out of Judaism. And they did not agree on a lot of things even though there were some things that they could enjoy together. And even in the Lord's church in the first century, there was division. First uh, Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 and following, we read. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now when you think about apostolic admonitions, these things that the apostles give to us, to encourage or instruct us, those in the first century in particular and us by extension, you think here we are 20 or 25 years removed from the cross and he says, I beseech you, I plead with you, I am begging with you that there be no divisions among you. Why is he pleading with them? Because there were divisions among them. Already within, within earshot of Calvary, there are divisions that are forming. The history of religion is the history of division. And Jesus tells us such should not be the case. The night before Jesus died in John chapter 17, and we're not plowing any new, new ground here with, uh, with these verses, but I want you to, uh, to bear in mind what Jesus' admonition is before we turn to our lesson at hand. In the prayer that he offers Prior to going to the garden, he says of his apostles, sanctify them with your truth or by your truth. Your word is truth. And then he offers another prayer. He had prayed for himself. He prays for his apostles. And now he prays for others, beginning in 20 and 21. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is praying for you, and he's praying for me. Right there. We, we believe because of the apostles' word. That's, that's what our New Testaments basically are are the words that the apostles penned by guidance of the Holy Spirit that have been passed down to us. And so he, he prays for them, and he prays for us. And what is his prayer for those immediately and all the way up to this time? That we be one as the Father and the Son are one. And brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you right now, it's not so in the Lord's church. It's not. There, there are... Divisions, minor divisions, maybe in families or fractions among families or those types of things. This congregation is at peace, and I praise God for that. But that doesn't mean that there still aren't concerns, even among our brethren here. And we have to be ever vigilant to pursue unity. Because if we do not pursue it, it will not last it is something that we have to work for and we have to work to maintain. You know, I've used this example before. It's a great example, especially if you have kids or if you are a kid that can understand. When your mother told you to brush your teeth before going to bed, did she ever tell you that ever again? Like every night for 10 years? Why? Why? Because if she didn't keep reminding you, you would forget to do it, right? And then when your kids come along, you do the same thing, and they will do the same for their children, right? I mean, it's, it's a normal thing. God continues to remind us over and over again through prophets and apostles and, and the biblical writers of things that are critical to the nature of his people. 
irrespective of the era in which they live. It does not matter. If they lived in the first century or in 2017, it doesn't matter on what continent you live. It does not matter the language that you speak. It doesn't matter what your socioeconomic position is, your race. None of that matters. We need to be reminded time and again of things that are important. Jesus describes a unity with the purpose of being a blessing to one another so a church can be built up and as a result, be a blessing to the world. A church that is not unified cannot bless the world. We can't. We we have to be unified. We have to be together, and we have to be one. And this is so important for us to think about. And and I'm going to challenge you right now to try to put a division in your brain between that part of you that's saying, I sure hope sister or brother so-and-so is listening to this, and yourself. I want you to push the brother and sister so-and-so to the side, and I want you to only think about yourself while I'm preaching this lesson. I don't want you to think about anybody but you. Because this is personal. And unity is about individuals coming together. It's not about me telling somebody to come together. It's about us deciding ourselves that we are going to be one. And I've titled this lesson Organic Unity because this unity that is described in Ephesians chapter 4, 1 through 3 is not an external or a mechanical thing. This is not, oh, we're unified because we say we're unified. You know, we live in the United States of America. All right, I don't think I really have to comment too much on that, right? All right, just because you say it's united does not make it so. Okay? Uh, external and mechanically, yes, we are. And internally, to a certain extent, we are as a country, but, you know, there are some, some problems that have been brewing for quite some time, and, and they are continuing to be a problem. But the type of unity that is described in the Scriptures for the New Testament church is an internal and an organic unity by virtue of the fact that the Lord's body is an organism, not an organization. It is a living body. It's an organism with Christ as its head. Okay, We are the body of Christ, and as a result, it is a living, breathing, moving, growing thing. It's organic. And that's what I want us to focus on. I want you to look at our our scripture again before we move much further. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness and longsuffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Why, oh why, is the Apostle Paul writing this to the church at Ephesus? Because they were having problems. He's not writing to them because they weren't experiencing this problem. He's writing because they are. It, It would make no sense for him to write to them these things if they had it all figured out and things were going well. There, were, there was a, a huge division in Ephesus between the Jewish brethren and the Gentile brethren. That, that's the, kind of the line of demarcation that, that is there. We, we don't have that problem, but we do have problems. And how do we take care of that? Well, there are five virtues that are listed in verse 2 characteristics, virtues that will lend itself toward this type of unity. And the first is humility. And and I want (laughs) to... This is another one of those words that's repeated over and over and over again in the New Testament. Why, oh why, do we need to be told that humility needs to be a part of our mindset? You know why? Because pride is an ugly thing, and everybody's got some. 
Every one of us. And I'm not talking about you're proud of your son or your daughter because they made honor roll. I'm talking about that internal pride that makes you think more highly of yourself than you should. Humility is an important part of the body being unified in an organic way. We have to leave our pride behind and understand that Jesus is the head of the church. He's going to tell the church what to do. And when he's ready for our opinion, he'll come ask for it. Even though we think ours is always the best, right? I, I mean, my opinion is the best. The, the Bible is very plain on this. And this teaching uh, may be one of the top teachings in all of Christianity. What does Jesus say the night he was betrayed? As they have shared the supper, he sits down with them. And what does he do? He, he disrobes, he ties a towel around his waist there in John 13. He washes the feet of the disciples, and, he's, and he, he dresses himself, and he says, Now, let me tell you what I just did. I, being your teacher, your master, have served you. And he's trying to fulfill some things he's been trying to tell them for quite some time on the road and at night and sitting down and walking by the way and all the time is that if you want to be first in the kingdom, you've got to make yourself a servant. You have to humble yourself to become a servant. This, this teaching is, it is so foundational to Christianity, I don't know why we seem to overlook it sometimes. Because it's there. Behind this screen is a body of water. That body of water, thanks to the, the men and others who have maintained it through the years, continues to serve us as a convenient place to immerse people into Christ. And the act of being baptized is an act of humility. The reason it's called calling on the name of the Lord in Acts chapter 2 and in Acts twenty two sixteen, 16, the reason it's calling on the name of the Lord is because you have to humble yourself and realize you can't save yourself. That only God can save you. It is an act of humility. The, the Christian walk begins in humility. And the first thing he says, you should not think more highly of yourselves than you are. Of course, I've got up here on the screen, we need to see ourselves as God sees us. You know, if we could see ourselves through God's eyes, we would look a whole lot smaller than we see when we look in the mirror. And that's why I believe that this is the lead characteristic of these five characteristics. Secondly, gentleness or meekness. Meekness is one of those words that we, we don't understand quite as well today as perhaps uh, years ago. Uh, a beast of burden was considered to be meek when he still contained all of his strength, but it was harnessed towards a purpose. It was called strength under control. That's, that's the best way that I can think of to define meekness. Strength under control. So to, in order to be gentle... And this sweet young lady over here wants me to hold her baby so bad. And every time she comes up to me, I'm in the middle of doing something. And I, and I promise you, I'm going to hold this baby when we get done here this morning. This baby made his first appearance here just in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and we're, we're so thankful that God has brought this precious life to us. But when I cradle a newborn baby, does that make me less strong than I am? But what do I have to do? I have to exercise control over that strength to not do harm to the child. You see? You, know, you see a big burly guy holding a baby? That's the perfect picture of meekness or gentleness because there's no way to do it otherwise. And that is the idea towards each other that we are still carrying all of our strength but we are cradling each other so as to do no harm this is an important aspect for us to consider um, 
The Apostle Paul also writes to, to Timothy, or excuse me, to Titus in Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, of some of the things he needs to teach the Christians he is serving. He says, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, that's our meekness, showing all humility to all men. Look at that gentleness and humility tied together once again. We, we need not deny the strengths that we have, but we need to put those things under the control of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, he says long-suffering. Long-suffering. You know, that's a nice way of saying suffers long. Right? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that great chapter of love that uh, we like to read at weddings and, and at other times to encourage us. Verse 4 says that love suffers long. It doesn't suffer short. It suffers long. Sometimes I'm going to, or you're going to, and we're going to need to suffer with each other. You know why? Because I'm a human being and you're a human being. And sometimes I'm going to say something, or I'm going to do or not do something, or you're going to say something, or I'm not going to do, or you're going to do or not do something, because it's just a part of being forgetful or being busy or being whatever. And we have to suffer through those things, loving each other along the way, providing each other the, the courtesy and avoiding the, the snap situations that are so detrimental to unity in the body of Christ. Fourthly, bearing with one another, forbearance, also in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7, love bears most things. Almost all things. Love bears all things. Now see, if we were writing it, we'd have to change a few of those words, right? Because people just don't understand what, what I'm dealing with. I think God does. And God instructs us that we are to bear with one another. You know what you, you bear? You bear burdens. And sometimes the burden is a treatment from another, or it may be something that someone else is going through. And you come alongside to bear with them. But this forbearance primarily in this context is dealing with our differences. You know, you didn't vote for who, who I voted for, so... You know, you're not even a true Christian anymore. Why do we do that to ourselves? We've got to bear with each other. We, th we think differently. We come from different backgrounds. We have different levels of education. We have different, 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 different all the time. And those differences can either be a beautiful part or the organic body of Christ or they'll be the things that tear us apart. You know what Paul says to the Corinthian uh, Christians earlier in the Corinthian letter? He says, not everybody's an eye, not everybody's an ear, and just because you're not an ear doesn't mean the eye's not important. You know, is the eye different from the ear? Oh yeah, very different. What about hands and feet and all the other parts of the body? We are body parts in the body of Christ, and just because I'm not you and you're not me doesn't mean one of us is lesser than the other. We're just different. And we have to bear with those differences. You know, sometimes our bodies develop more quickly in some areas than they do in others. And some areas kind of lag behind. We bear with it. We endure. And lastly, 
How do we bear with one another? In love. This, this organic unity is only possible if these five characteristics are working together in all of the individual parts of the body. Well, guess what? We're not going to get it done perfectly. But one of the beautiful things is that just as God knows we're not going to be perfect, even after we come out of the baptistry, we're still going to sin. He provides us a way to take care of that. As we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us, continuously cleanses us as we're walking in the light. It's a beautiful thing. God made provision. At the same time, we need to make provision for each other in humility. And that's where it starts. I mean, you know, the, the whole swallowing our pride. Is, you can't have these other four things as a part of our unity or the things that make for unity if we don't swallow our pride to begin with. Well, you know, if only he would, if only she would, isn't that what we think? And what did I tell you to do? Get that out of your head. You look at yourself. Look at yourself. And he says down in verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavoring to keep means diligent to preserve it. Being diligent to do that. And that causes a particular state to continue. And when we are diligent to preserve, we are continuing the state of this unity of the Spirit. We are causing that to happen. And just as we can cause it to divide, we can also cause it to stay. What's our choice? What is our choice? What does God want us to be? In this place, in this time, what has he called for us to be? Because without unity, we're nothing. We are absolutely nothing. In Colossians chapter 3, which is a parallel letter to the Ephesian letter. Both were written by Paul at the same time and contain a lot of the same instruction, just using uh, slightly different wording. Chapter 3, beginning in verse 12, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another even as Christ forgave you so you also must do but above all these things put on love which is the bond of perfection did you see your five things there church at Ephesus wasn't the only one that needed to look into those five things throws in a few extras here for Colossae We need, no, we must. The Lord demands no less of us. We must do this. It's all of our jobs. Every one of us has a role to play in maintaining this unity. And so I'm going to ask you right now. I told you I didn't want to hear about anybody else. I want to hear about you. I'm going to ask you right now, who is it you need to go to to make things right this morning? What is it you need to correct today? A brother or a sister or a family? What is it you need to do right now to be diligent, to cause to uh, continue this unity in the church? Or to make it stronger. Have you offended someone or have they offended you? Do you need to humble yourself even though you were the offended party and go to them and make things right? Jesus tells us to do both. If you remember that, that your brother has sinned against you, what does he tell you to do? You go to them. If you remember that you sinned against them and they have something against you, what does he tell you to do? 
to go to them. In both cases, you're to go. And you know what it requires? It requires us to humble ourselves. To humble ourselves. To make things right. If the last sermon that I ever preach here on a Sunday morning is a sermon that brings the body of Christ together, then I died with a clear conscience. You need to make something right today. We're about to sing a song. If you'd like publicly to come and ask for prayers, if you need to confess sin, maybe there's some discouragement that's coming to your life, or maybe you're facing a, a physical issue for which you would like our prayers. We would love to pray with you and pray for you this morning. Or perhaps you're here today and you've never named the name of Christ. You've never put him on to begin with. You've never humbled yourself to begin with and made that statement that I can't save myself. Do you believe in Jesus as the Son of God? Are you willing to confess his, his beautiful, precious name? Are you willing to repent of the sins for which Jesus died? And humble yourself and be immersed in water for the remission of your sins and raised to walk in a new life, clothed in Christ, forgiven, covered by the blood. We've got a song picked out for you this morning. Please don't wait. Don't wait. Tomorrow may never come. Let's make things right today. Would you come as together we stand and sing?